Okay, my friends. Most of you know me, I'm Jerry Blevins. And um, I wanted to make this video uh, because of this uh, 2018 election. Um, I want to talk to anybody who will listen and and, and share some of some concerns of mine. Uh, I'd like to do a, um, I'll just ask you a question. Uh, have you done a like a situational analysis on my reservation of just in your own head about the, what our problems are, uh, where we're headed, what we're going to do, uh, what problems we're facing and all. Have you thought about all that stuff or is it still out there kind of jumbled and mumbled together? The truth of the matter is that we can't make uh, any kind of analysis or or concrete decision on anything if we don't have all the knowledge that we need uh, to understand the problems that we're facing. And a big part of that is that uh, we don't have the knowledge that's available uh, because, and we can't therefore educate ourselves because the government isn't sharing the problems that they're running into. Um, maybe they're afraid that we will see that they don't know what they're doing or could be a number of things, who knows, um, that couldn't be it, but it's what it amounts to is that we don't have enough uh, information and data to to make a, a qualified uh, situa situational analysis, even from our own heads. And the reason for that is a separation of knowledge. And before I get into that, I guess in for this video, I'm going to be addressing uh, I want to address three systemic problems that exist in our tribe that are interfering with our government. And I'm not saying that these are the only ones, but they're the ones that that I see that that are affecting us and our growth and, and everything. And you'll you, you'll um, see that in a moment. But when we need to get the knowledge, and that's our, our first problem, is that we don't we don't have the knowledge base, and it's not our fault. So we need to remember to always ask the unanswered question. And then we need to follow up and ask questions about the answer that we're given so that we can understand these issues and we can understand even more that they understand. So, so it's very important that we understand where we are coming from ourselves. So we see that there's a separation of knowledge. There's there's a drawback uh, from the council into a, a secrecy environment. And and this is usually due to some, maybe somebody on there who's, who's believes in secrecy, but the secrecy has been going on for a long time. And it's not just, um, it's just not this council, it goes way back. They've been slowly, slowly, pulling back into a secret organization as, as it were and and taking on all the responsibilities and drawing back from the people uh, and and this this gives them total control because they stop sharing information so then there, there's a separation of knowledge in this secrecy uh, and then from our past council we can see that there's a lot of disinformation going on most times there's no information at all uh, when you ask them questions, you get nothing but double speak and heuristics, uh, basically just answering uh, questions without any detail thought. So our our first systemic problem is that is a problem of secrecy, of the secret society that it, that the council has become that they separate and and they become very exclusive and and, and tight mouthed. There is a possible fix for this kind of thing, and that's open up the meetings, uh, get some membership input to share the share information and policy development. And what I'm talking about here is a return to the general council, and in the way it's supposed to be set up, make it like a hub of communication, information information sharing, and discussion and and, and question and answers, and that kind of thing. But this lack of communication has been coming progressively worse. Uh, and we can see that it's progressively worse to the point that we can see that it's intentional. Uh, this isn't a byproduct of anything. Uh, this is intentional, keep, it, keep the people in the dark scenario. So 
we need to think about our expectations and, and what we're really expecting from the people we we vote for because uh, the secrecy is basically an unspecified prerequisite uh, for accept for excuse me it's a prerequisite uh, for acceptance into the group and it, it implies an unspoken loyalty to the group or loyalty to the people. So right off the bat, we have a burden of loyalty. The, the candidates are carrying a burden of loyalty because before the before the election, their their loyalty is one hundred percent to the people. But after the election, there's an unspoken loyalty to the group that emerges. Now, loyalty isn't isn't uh, loyalty isn't a systemic problem. Loyalty is a condition of the heart. I'll go into that in a little bit. But loyalty to the group uh, is, is can be characterized and seen because they're keeping us in the dark. All we have to go by is their behavior. So what we see is a silence. They become very silent. Uh, there's avoidance. They go through the back door. They uh, leave early, stay late. Uh, there's a lot of double speak when you answer to ask their questions, and and there's heuristics of just jumping to conclusions or or answering your questions without even really thinking about it. So all this adds up to dishonesty. So for any healthy relationship between you between a man and a woman in a marital relationship, or a boyfriend and a girlfriend, a, a, a woman and her children, a, a man and his children, or a job, your boss. Any relationship that you can think of for it to be a healthy relationship has to have three legs that it must stand on. And those legs are essential. Think of it like a stool that you're sitting on. Each one of those legs helps support you. And without one of those legs, you're going to fall over. Okay, now, what, we're, what I'm talking about here is, is for this healthy relationship is We've got to have trust, we've got to have loyalty, and we've got to have respect. Those are three of the main things that we've got to have. So without any of those, any re healthy relationship has to have those three elements. So when we look at this kind of a relationship with our tribe, with our council, we can see that there's no trust there. They've broken that trust. There's no trust there at all. There's no loyalty because that trust is broken. It's hard to be loyal to them and there's, we can't respect them. So if you can't respect somebody, you can't be loyal to them. And if you can't be loyal to them, then it's because you can't trust them. See, all three of these work together without any one of them, they all, that falls. So we don't have any trust with our tribe, our council. We don't, there we see no loyalty from them. And so we, they, in return, they get no respect. So what we see is, is like a dysfunctional, a dis, basically is a dysfunctional system. And we see it from the bottom up. Um, we see the holes in the bucket. Um, you can call it creative accounting, avenues of cash flow. Who can name it what you want? But the fact of the matter is, like if you're driving a brand new car or any kind of car, your own car, and, and something that acts different. Uh, there's something knocking in, in the engine. Maybe there's something wrong with the electrical system. Maybe the lights aren't working. Uh, maybe it's backfiring. A whole list of things could be the problem. My, my point is, is that you don't need to be a mechanic to understand that your car needs to be fixed. Okay, if it's wandering off the road when you let the wheel go, you know that it's out of alignment or something's wrong. So that that has to be fixed. So um, we see this dysfunctional system. We don't have to be a mechanic, but we can see that it needs to be fixed. There's, and the only thing we can use up as a base for that is our empirical knowledge. And in some cases, we have data and documents and that sort of thing to prove uh, that things are not good, okay? Uh, but for the most part, for most of us, we have that empirical knowledge of, of, of the 
the madam of their councilman's behaviors. And those behaviors uh, give us this empirical knowledge that compels us uh, to basically accept their behavior as the truth. Um, and their behaviors are, is that the distrust, distrust and this loyalty is, is they're breaking it and they're pulling back from the people. They're separating uh, themselves from the people in, in, in a sense that they won't, we're not in any way, they're not even in the information part of it. There is no public relations. There's no human resources. There's, there's, I mean, there's nothing to let the public know. So they're drawing a completely back away from the people and, and not con communicating with the people, just basically certain people who are in the loop, you might say. So this drawing back of the people is, a, is not a good thing from the people is not a good thing. It's, it's a matter of fact, it's a bad thing. I'll give you a reference to that in, in the Bible, for those of you who believe in the Bible. Um, Jesus Christ is talking to seven churches in the book of Revelations. And uh, there's one church that he talks to, and he, he tells each church the things that they, they are doing good that he don't like, uh, that, I mean, that they're doing bad and he don't like. And he also finishes with them telling them who, who, what they're doing that's good that he does like. And this, this one church, church in particular, he says this, uh, I, on the, I, uh, I commend you on or because you rejected the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Okay, this church rejected the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans, it means um, to separate the laity. So in the spiritual sense, in the church sense, it's, a, it's a, the separating the laity from, from the heads of the church or those, the, I guess, the priesthood from the laity or in, in, in uh, maybe in Karl Marx uh, or in fascism or so even socialism, you have a separation where the, where the uh, civilization or the people are the center, but it's the government that's up above them making everything happen supposedly for them. So there's a separation from, from the rulers or, or those the laws. Uh, and there's also um, a separation of laws that that um, that there's one side for them and, and, and it applies only to other another group of people. So this doctrine of the Nicolaitans, this separation of, from the from the governing body to from the people, is is something that Jesus Christ Himself doesn't like. He he said, "This I have, uh, this this I commend you for," or some similar to that, is that you you reject this teaching of the Nicolaitans. So right here we can see that what they're doing, and when you apply this to govern the government, uh, this concept or this strategy, you can see that there's the separation from the government, from the people, is basically the same thing. So, so what we have is basically at work here is the doctrine of the Nicolaitan, they're separating the laity. So in my, in my view, and uh, this is a little getting closer to authoritarianism, um, socialism, um, and and if that would other compact would have uh, not the compact, but if the uh, constitution would have passed, uh, we would be faced with um, I think a little bit of fascism, and we're getting that close. And so but we averted a takeover. But we have to be careful of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, where they separate themselves from the people. So, but all the things, because they keep us in the dark, we don't know what they're up to. And this is not right. Uh, under the corporate charter, we have a right as, as members of, of the corporation to be informed of what the government is doing or what the, 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 the brass is doing. And they should be coming to us once a month, telling us and informing us, giving us reports, uh, giving us uh, how their plans are going and how they're moving forward with, with their economic development plans or whatever. They should be reporting to us. It should not be where we're sitting there giving, telling them what our problems are and letting them ignore us and not, and not say anything. They have this whole, um, this whole, uh, 
system upside down when it when it when it comes to uh, our day in front of the council and and we we really do need that back. But the behaviors that we see from them, we have to stop and think of what what do they really do tell us. And when I look at it, what I see overall is as I see that the council going years back, I can see that the council in certain ways are trapped and they're trapped into doing the will of the federal government. Uh, let's the top, all the Department of Interior, like the BIA, the EPA, the BIA, um, National Parks, uh, Forest Service, HUD, the BIA, uh, special, not special services, but environmental, all, all this kind of stuff even into the our police force. These, these, this money that comes from all these departments that helps us run our government, they all come come to us with with, with regulations, and if we want to work for them, we have to go by their regulations and their laws, what they the laws they set up, not ours, it's theirs. So, they're hiring us to do basically to do the job that they should do, and if they were doing it, we would be bitching about it because we say we could do those jobs. So, it's, you know, it's a two-edged sword. But what I'm talking about is purchase compliance. This is done through our funding sources and, our, and through our contracts. It's sort of kind of like a, a, a mind, a thought control or, or behavior modification in a way. It's sort of redesigning our intellectual frame and back in and for work where we don't realize it's really happening. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When you repeat something over and over and over, it becomes a part of you. There's an old saying that goes, we move, we move towards and become like those things we think about. So if you think about it and tell yourself things long enough, you start to believe it. And I, I think that's true. Because when I was young, I was teased a lot as a child. And I was teased, and I, I was not big enough to do anything about it. So the only thing I'd do is hang my head. And so the only way I could learn to deal with it is by saying, I don't care. I don't care. Call me four eyes, call me cross eyed, call me cock eyed, call me what you want. I don't care. I got to the point where I said, I just don't care anymore. I'm not, I'm going to stop letting it hurt me. And so I grew up in my early years with that attitude of, I don't care that constant reinforcement of that of that basically self-directive. When I got into my teen years, I didn't realize it then, but later on I did. And that was I got to the point where I didn't care. Like I said, you move towards and become like those things you think about. If you think you don't care and keep telling yourself you don't care, you will come to a place where you will stop caring because you will follow your thoughts. And, and in relation to that, when when you, you hear your kids saying, I hate you, and or I don't care, kids are kids, they'll say those things. But when you hear it constantly, you tell yourself, you don't, if, if you tell yourself, I don't care, or I hate you, sooner, if you do it all the time, then sooner or later, you will convince yourself that that's true. And what the reason I'm saying this is because when the government, when the government funding agencies come down with their regulation and their laws and the reason and their ideology behind those things, these people that work for them, they begin pushing those 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 laws, those I that ideology. And I'm not saying it's bad or good, but what I'm saying is that they it affects their thinking, their 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 internal framework. It starts to reprogram their computer, as it were. And we don't really have a choice because if we do step out of line or if we do anything, they just tell them it's irrelevant. You, you, you will comply. You will follow the directions. You will follow your regulations. You will comply. Now, does it, to me, to you, does that sound like we are free? This kind of thing renders a council impotent. So it becomes easier for the council to take a contribution or a benefit and go along with an impotent system uh, rather than, than fight, and show strength and some courage, have some vision, uh, honor and integrity. As a candidate, you're going to make promises. 
And as a voter, you're going to answer these. Uh, you're going to hear those promises from from the candidates. Those promises will many of them will be on earnest, or they will be honest. But in reality, the government holds the purse strings. So to get paid, you got to do what you're told. So it's limited. There's no freedom there. There's there's hardly any freedom there. See. So as long as you do it, you're free to do what you want. As long as you do what you're told. That's purchase compliance. Systemic problem number two. As a candidate and as a voter, you need to ask your candidate, how are you going to deal with this issue? Because this is a systemic issue and it goes out. It, it, it affects every one of us. So this election is very important and it needs to be taken seriously because we're on the precipice of a, of a, of a black hole. And once we go in there, there's no coming out. So we really have to, to put our heads together and, and let's think about what we're thinking about. We need to think about our thinking. We need to analyze, we need to ask questions, and then we need to, to question the answers. But we need to keep in mind while we're doing all of this that we have biases and that we use heuristics uh, and basically we jump to conclusions or uh, we make a decision without any detailed thought about it at all. But we all, well, we all think we all know that biases can lead to a faulty decisions and, and a wrong choice. So long, allowing biases into our, our voting decision is is basically not a mistake that we can afford because the stakes are too high. So before we vote, let's ask ourselves questions. Why am I voting for this person? Then question your answer. And you, it's going to be you have to be honest with yourself. It's required. Uh, self disclosure is essential, but also self discovery is a consequential of this. It's a consequence of of going through this. So you'll learn things about yourself. Uh, basically, what I'm asking you to do is is um, make yourself accountable to you. Okay. Uh, now I'd like to do a little thing here um, on, on some values, just to kind of kind of set some your thinking straight, or not straight, but set your thinking to where you're actually thinking about some things. What I'd like to do is take if you to do is in your own mind, uh, you don't have to get detailed about this, but just kind of offhand values. Uh, take everything you own. Everything you own has a monetary value. Okay, so take that value and and add to everything you own every little thing you own and put a value on it and accumulate it and, and sum it up how much am i worth my ranch my car my horses my cows um all this stuff how much am i worth and and then when you get and and, and you can even inflate that number and then add on top of that add in your uh emotional and sentimental value uh, to that monetary system. So it gets even larger in value. Okay, then you take that and put it over here and you and then you place a value, a monetary value on everything that we have as a Blackfeet nation, as our Bikani nation, uh, including all of our assets, our land, our water, our gas, our oil, um, all of everything that we could possibly turn into money. Uh, how put a, how much was that all that worth? Okay, now on top of that monetary value, place another just like I asked you before. Place a value on your sentimental and and your emotional attachments. Place a value on your culture. Place a value on your traditions. Um, place a value on your unique identity, uh, your environment, the mountains. Uh, Oh, the water, the animals, and your attachment to them. Place a value on your children and your children's right to have and enjoy the uniqueness of all these things we have. People don't seem to realize that there are people fighting all over the world, the globe. They're fighting. And they're all fighting for some place that they can call home. People, we've done our fighting. We've got our home. 
We have our home. Why are we trying to give it away? Why are we trying to give the things that are, is on our land that is precious to us? Why are we giving it to the whites who took everything from us already? Does this, this doesn't seem right. There's a value not, that's not right there. And not only that, but we are very unique as a nation because we live on the, the very land that our ancestors lived on. The white man has never owned our land. Never. So we live on our own land, our own land, what other people are dying for and fighting, giving their lives for that they could have. We have it, and we're just throwing it away. We're not valuing it at all. We need to put a greater value on this because we are unique Amongst other tribes, just a few other tribes, we're the only ones that still live on our same land that we have always had. So ask yourself, does the value of everything you own, own the, the, your, your final uh, amount, uh, does that supersede the value of everything that we have as a nation? Because your answer will determine your vote. Uh, you'll either vote personal prosperity at, at the expense of the Blackfeet Nation's assets, or you're going to vote for your, or you're going to vote in favor to keep your Blackfeet Nation's assets, probably at the uh, expense of maybe being uh, perhaps your personal prosperity. Keeping in mind that prosperity doesn't always mean financial prosperity or monetary prosperity. That prosperity can be defined in many different ways. So let me back up to say that government funding equals purchase compliance. And that equals a higher standard of living. And that equals some degree of prosperity to only a few that work there. That's why there's all those people that are working for the government. They're up there. They're, they're, um, their retirements are paid for. They're making good money. They have nice homes. They're able to do things, to remodel their homes, to put in places. They're all doing good. But they're all connected to this purchase compliance. They've all agreed to comply. And I have even been there myself. I ran the REACH program. There were programs that I had to comply with, reg regulations that I had to comply, comply with. But those, those regulations was ensuring that the people had a good, warm place to stay. And, and I had the materials to do that. And we helped a lot of people on this reservation. So some of those regulations are good, but only when you're working for those funding agencies. So this begs the question is, is how do we prosper as a nation uh, and as individuals without government funding, block grants or whatever the funding source may be? This is a systemic problem of forced compliance. It exists because government policy and regulations, and, and it creates functional disorganization. The tribe is disorganized because it's left that way. Nobody's paying attention to it because it's functional in the sense that nobody sees us moving this money from here to there and over to here to over to there, going on a trip, cutting a slice off for this guy, cutting a slice off for that guy. Everything is, everybody's, it's just no... Um, no structure to it really, no oversight at all. And these guys are just spending their money and doing whatever. Uh, this forced compliance or, or purchase compliance create, creates this functional disorganization because the, the council seems to be uh, trapped in, uh, with these regulations surrounding them. And this is why even the Sioux are saying we live we don't live in a free reservation. Stop calling it a reservation. They're saying we're, we live in actual um, concentration camps. And we even have a number according according to the, some of the people, who, uh, the Sioux. So we can see that they've, they've, we might seem like we're free, but they've got us regulated all the way around. And, it, and that's what keeps us from growing. So this is a systemic problem that really needs um, attention. Now, the next problem is even getting a little bit more. So, you know, I'm saying these three problems are, 
aren't aren't easy problems at all. But the next problem is is even greater. Ah. Uh, a third systemic problem, uh, let me re get into that by first saying that one day I was going through, uh, I was on the internet, so I decided to get into the federal government and I looked up uh, CFR 25. It's it's long. And in there, in CFR 25, uh, they have the creation of the BIA. Then you get into that and that's how all the, B there's a whole, huge section, I mean, it's almost all section of how the BIA is supposed to operate and run. In that, all within that, and I mean, it, it gets into law and order and, and just about everything you can think of. But the one thing that I wanted to talk about is that there was, a, I found a little directive in there. And that directive said that the, the, the tribes had, the, the BIA had to have the tribes develop economic, five-year economic development plans. And and so I was thinking about that and I thought, well, you know, that would be pretty cool. So I was mentioning to some people, especially since I read that and I read all what would go into that. And to me, if everybody made a plan with including all those things that the BIA or the Fed said that should be in there, I think it would be really good. But I, I, I didn't know if there was one or not. And so I was mentioning that into with a group of people that we were sitting around and visiting with. And this one woman in the in the group said, uh, hey, I, I have that. And she said, um, I know where you can get it. She said, you can get it at the, the community college. It's locked behind closed doors. I said, really? And she said, yeah. She said, but I have a copy. She said, I'll let you read it. A couple of days later, she came back and she had this book about three inches thick and it i thought man this this is going to be good and it was called the blackfeet overall economic development plan from 1992 to 1997 and it was pre prepared by uh Farrell wagner uh, uh, which gave the uh, eda or I, I don't know employment development director or education I, I don't know anyway she's part of planning but after I read the BIA directive, and then so I was eager to read what the tribe had put together. And after I read it, I sat back and this is what I thought. I thought, how could somebody who has great responsibility like a tribal lawyer and who is given a great responsibility of de developing an economic development plan for the tribe, Put nothing into it. There's nothing substantial in it. Nothing. It's just all rhetoric and there's no thought. It correlates to the BIA directive in the tribunal to develop this plan in the outline of what it must contain, but where they said the tribes must develop a plan to accommodate this issue, or the tribe must develop a plan for to do what they're going to do with their, with their, um, say, oil and gas, whatever the resource was, uh, forestry, uh, um, all everything was included in it. So I was eager to read read the, the, the I was able to read it, and when I come out of that, I thought, where everything where it said that the BIA says you must do this. The plan itself said, we will do this. There was no plan there. There was just a change of words. It went from must to will. It was basically copied verbatim with just a few words tapped in there that sometimes there was a little something thrown in that, that didn't make any sense. Oh. So, my, I, that it points, it seems to me that we've stumbled on something here that is symptomatic of, of, of like a contagion that, that weakens our system and it creates um, conditions that we find ourselves in right now. And that condition is apathy. 
this is very serious. Uh, and let me talk a little bit more about this. This woman could have done it because she was apathetic. She could have done it the way she did it because of just compliance to regulations. Because remember that of, of we're purchase compliance. You comply or you don't get paid. You, 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 um, you will comply. So if they're going to hold back the money, they're going to take this thing out and they're going to fill it out as fast as they could and get it shipped off so that they can get their money. And maybe that's what it was, just a compliance thing to the regulations. Maybe it was not taking her job seriously. Or maybe they don't know how to do it. Maybe she was winging it. But one thing that becomes clear in this is that the council isn't proofreading the material. There is no professional systemic oversight. This is the problem. This is a deep, serious problem. We select our council who are supposed to be the heads of our government. These people job is to read. They have to read these things. Nobody read that. If they did, they were complicit in it. It's not an economic development plan for five years. It's not a plan at all. When somebody says, you got to do this. You must perform this. And then you turn and say, okay, we will perform that. And then you don't do it. It's not a plan. So we really have stumbled onto something here that is a symptom of, of like a contagion that, that does weaken our system. Um, this is very serious because it tells us that there is no, no real oversight going on in the executive level. There's no real oversight going on in our system. They're not proofreading the materials. They're signing off on them left and right. They're taking what the lawyers say and the professionals say, as that's their, you know, I trust you, this is what you did. And so they sign off on it. It happens, I've been there for years. I have known what it does. They sign off on things without even looking at it. This is a part of our systemic problem is that our leaders aren't really taking their jobs professionally or doing it professionally. They're doing their jobs, but they're not doing a professional job at being a professional. Now, the take Saihi and planning both. We don't know anything of what's going on in planning. We don't know anything that's going on with Saihi. We don't even know what Saihi is all about. We need to make sure that Saihi gets some new blood and somebody with some vision and creativity in there. Um, we need to take all the contracts with Saihi and reevaluate and put some public transparency in there so that people know what's going on also. Uh, but this systemic problem can only be fixed by by the voter and nobody else, because you have to know who you're voting for. You have to know if the purple that your vote person that you're voting for can actually fix these problems. So what do we do with unprofessional professionals? There's no way out. They they there's no back door. There's no escape clause for the people. So once we put somebody in there that's supposed to be professional and they show themselves to be idiots, we need to get a way to get them out of there. And if, if they're part of the council, we can't expect the council to get them out of there because they are all part of this group, group this, this unspoken loyalty to this group. So with all this in mind, there's some questions to ask your candidate and, and as we are a candidate, here are some questions you need to consider. First, what are your loyalties? Who are you loyal to? Prioritize your loyalties for us. First, second, third. Family, friends, Blackfeet people, council, personal gain. Where do your loyalties lie? Nine times out of 10, you're gonna get a lie because every one of them are going to say, the Blackfeet people come first. But in here, it's family, it's friends, it's personal gain. So you're not looking for a real answer as much as you're looking for how they answer the question. Another question we could ask them is, do you believe that the water compact was fair and legal? And why? 
If you don't think it was legal, what are you going to do about it to correct it? This is still an ongoing issue. It's not been solved. So what is your candidate going to do about this? Does he agree with the water compact? Or does he agree that, that it, was, it was wrong? We've proven, we have proof that it was illegal. We have, there's no problem with that. We have a pro proof of that. But does you, what does your candidate feel? Because that tells you where your candidate's gonna side in these issues. You'd have to know where your candidate comes down with these important issues. If they, don't, if they believe the water compact was illegal, then what can you do about it to correct it? How will you address the uh, excuse me? How will you address the systemic problems of secrecy, purchase compliance, or force compliance, and professional apathy, uh, the lack of oversight, which means it's basically the lack of oversight of our professionals. There's nobody looking over these guys' shoulders. They're doing anything they want to. I'm, I'm not saying they're not doing their job at all, but I'm saying there, there's nobody making them get up and get on the ball. Uh, ask your council if they will advocate for a return to the general council as it's supposed to be. Uh, why would you do that and how and when? And the last thing I, I think is that ask them is, will you agree to upgrade the plan of operation? to address and resolve organizational and systemic issues. See, you need somebody with their head in, in policy. You need somebody that has a, a brain for uh, administrative of where, where exactly you can make, make changes in the system to force a different outcome. Now, a good lawyer can do all that. And it's my feeling that um, I think that as, as a people, we owe it to ourselves to get the best government that we can. We owe it to our people to, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our grandchildren, we owe it to everybody we can think of, that we have to, we have to come together as a people and set this thing straight. There's no way around it. I, want to, I hope you put your thoughts together, ask a lot of very serious questions to your candidates. Don't let them get away with, uh, I'm for education, I'm for economic development, and I'm for health, whatever. If you're a councilman, you're for those things anyway, you better be. So, get down into detail with your candidate and ask them some very serious questions about the issues of what we're going through because they are very serious issues. So I pray that you make the right decisions, that you base it on knowledge and facts and not because he's your cousin, not because he's your relative or your friend, because he, he's been, he treated me good all his life, all my life. He's always been a good man. I'm gonna put him on the council and maybe he should be on the council. But ask yourself the question, can he deal with the systemic problems? Can he fix the system? Or is he gonna be one of those at six packs with a cigarette and cowboy hat? Takes a couple of drags. Yeah, we need people up there that wanna be up there because they know how to be there. So think about that and vote for the right person. And my prayer is with you that you make the right choice. God bless you.